Please remain standing and turn your Bible together with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 1 to 7. Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 1 to 7. Hear the holy and infallible word of God from Isaiah chapter 9. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of all the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. And they are glad when they divided the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in, in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, this morning as we consider and reflect on the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, that wonder that you have prefer, performed through the birth of your, your son, Jesus Christ, from the Virgin Mary. We ask you to illumine our hearts and our minds to the understanding of your word, so that each and every one of us will not be deceived by this sentiment of feast and celebration that we see around us that we all would come to your word and to your son, Jesus Christ, with a worshiping heart, a heart that has been touched and changed and regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, not only to understand the incarnation, but also to give glory to you through the coming of you, our God, in the flesh. Would you visit your people and the whole world this morning with the truth of the wonder of the incarnation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we are interrupting our series on the book of Hebrews for one reason. And the reason is you look around you and you observe how people are reacting and responding to the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what you see around you is really a madness. A celebration and feast where Christ, the Son of God, who had been incarnated and born of the Virgin Mary, is absent. We live in a time and celebration and even a season where Christ, the center of this feast and celebration, is left out. 
and uh, it gives you as a preacher a sense of responsibility and duty to address the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ in time like this. Isaiah in chapter 9 introduces two forces that the Bible often mentions as two opposite words, two opposite or antagonistic forces or kingdoms which always comes against one another to invade or to concur a place or a mind to accomplish their intended purposes. And these two words are darkness and light. You go to the Gospel of John chapter 1 where John tells us this in him, in Christ was life and the life was the light of man. And the light shines in darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You see both darkness and light being contrasted in John chapter 1. Why darkness and light? The same apostle in chapter 3 verse 19 tells us this. And this is the judgment. This is the conclusion. This is the truth. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works was evil. Again, another contrast between darkness and light. And people loving darkness more than they love the light. But do you know before the actual birth of our Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, you remember when the, angel came, when the angel came to the shepherds, it was dark. And in Luke chapter 2, the Bible tells us, and a great line was shone upon them. And they were afraid. But the angel came to deliver to them a good tidings, a good news, the best news that we'd ever hear in this world. And the news was about the birth of a child. But that light, you see, was introduced to us and to the whole world 100, 100 years before the actual birth of our Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. We see that light being introduced, being declared to us in the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9, verse, verse 2, where Isaiah said, The people who, was, who, who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those, and those who dwelt in, uh, in, in, in the land of darkness, to them have shone a great light. Now you need to ask, what was this darkness? What was this deep darkness that the people were living under? What is he talking about? What is this darkness? You see, this darkness came for two reasons. Because of two reasons. First, it was an external darkness. It was an outwardly darkness because of the invasion of the Assyrians upon the people of Israel. And those of you who lived under oppression, under the invasion of another nation, you would understand the distress and the depression that oppression would bring to you and to your life. Their life was uh, dark and they were living in darkness. But there was another darkness that they had in their life. And that was the inward darkness of their soul. The plight of their sin. Because of their rejection of God. Because of their disobedience uh, to the true and the living God. They were living in darkness. So both outward, external darkness, but also inward and inner darkness because of sin. Sin was oppressing them. They were in the, in, in the imprisonment and under the wrath uh, and, and punishment of God. It was a real darkness, my friends. 
And anyone who lives in sin and under the bondage of sin and a sense of the wrath of God being uh, upon him, he lives in darkness. But Isaiah, you see, comes with a prophecy and he says to the people, but not like the former times, your time of oppression and darkness because of sin, but now something is about to come. And the good news of the light that Isaiah had was in relation to verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting uh, Father and Prince of Peace. The light that Isaiah was referring to was in relation to this good and great news of light. You see, they were living in a time where the darkness of death, on the darkness of death, was coming the light of life. On the darkness of ignorance, the lack of the knowledge of God, was coming the light of knowledge of God. On the darkness of sin and misery was coming the light of salvation. No reason you see why Isaiah is calling this child a wonderful child. Because it is, it is as if you are seeing a king and you are full of awe. Because you see a king, a child but a king. A child who claimed to be the, the light of the world was coming. And we see the wonder of incarnation this morning in three ways in our text this morning. In the identity of the child, in the names of the child, and in the accomplishments of the child. The first one was the identity of the child, Isaiah said, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. A child is born, Isaiah said, but this child was a gift. He was not, he was not born for a Mr. and Mrs. so and so, but he was born unto us, unto all people especially those who live in darkness and under the bondage of sin and the wrath and divine punishment. C.S. Lewis, uh, Lewis one time said, The Son of God became man to enable men to become the sons of God. He also said the incarnation of Jesus Christ was the grand miracle because all other miracles follow that miracle, including the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. If there is no incarnation, there will not be resurrection. If there is no incarnation, there will not be uh, other miracles that we see, you see in the scriptures. This is the greatest miracle that God uh, accomplished for his people. God becoming man. And Isaiah said, For at, and to us a child is born, to us a son is given. He is given by God, but he was born in a, in a, in a normal and human way. He was born of a woman. He was born from a woman. In the Nicene Creed that you just confessed this morning, you confessed that you believe, you believe in Jesus Christ as God, very God. You also said, I believe in Jesus Christ who was not created but begotten and incarnated from the Virgin Mary. That's what he confessed. He is not less man. He is not less divine. He is fully man and fully God. No confusion about that. Many have denied this doctrine, but the Bible is very clear about that. 
He is fully God and fully man. In Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul reminds us of this. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under law, so that we might receive adoption of sons. So why was he, why was he was born? He was born to be the mediator between God and man. He was born to be a savior. That's why you see why I was saying, I was saying earlier, when you see Jesus being left out, absent from this celebration, your heart goes for all the people who, who lose the meaning of the birth of Jesus Christ. They're missing a light. A light for knowledge, a light for salvation. But he was born of a woman. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, Paul said, For there is one God, and there is one, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He calls him the man. The God man. God who, uh, beca who became flesh. The God man. But Isaiah also takes us to the names of this child. He is he's truly man, truly God, fully God, fully man. But notice his names. That's where you see the wonder of incarnation. Isaiah said, he, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Why the phrase wonder? Why not Isaiah say, just a counselor. Why wonderful counselor? Why this phrase, a wonder? Because hearing about him, seeing him by faith, brings an awe to your life. Think about the partition of the Red Sea into two parts. Think about the drawing of water from the rock. Think about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. All those miracles cause you to stand in awe. Now Isaiah is saying this child is the reason for all those awe oh, that you feel in your life. His incarnation should cause you to stand as if you are seeing a king. A child but a king. A wonderful child. Wonder through and through. Because this child brings you to an encounter with the true and the living God. John said no one has seen God but the God who, uh, who lived with him, who had been with him uh, eternally. His son made the father known to us. We see God through this child. We know God through this child. This child should bring an awe to your life. But he's also a wonderful counselor. You know, we live in a time where, you know, people always tell you, I'm seeing a counselor. I'm visiting a counselor. I have a problem. I am not stable. I'm, I'm struggling. What are you doing about it? Um, I'm seeing a counselor. I'm seeking help. Presidents and kings in our world, around them they have counselors. Some of the counselors, they give them bad advice and they fire, they fire them. But they do have counselors around them, not this child. Not this child. He is the source of all wisdom, understanding, and counsel. Isaiah 11:2, And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is Christ. This is the child. That most of our population today is missing. A wonderful counselor. The psalmist in, I, in, in Psalm 16, 7, he said, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. 
Well, Jeremiah tells us the heart is the most wicked member of our body. No one understands the heart. It's wicked. But here the psalmist is saying, my heart instructs me even at night. This is a regenerated heart. A heart that stores up the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ, in her life. Even at night, when you are afraid, when you are uh, disturbed by, uh, by a, a fearful dream, you can, uh, you can remember uh, Christ, you can remember all the wisdom that has been given to you in the Word of God and be courageous. There is counsel, there is wisdom, there is understanding, there is enlightenment in this child. He is the source of all Wisdom and understanding. Psalm 1, 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the, wi- the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Why? To gain wisdom. To gain counsel. You need wisdom, you need counsel, you need understanding in life, in this decision making. You have Christ. You have this child, a wonderful counselor. But he's also a mighty God. Isaiah said his name will be a mighty God. Not just God, but almighty God. The Hebrew word El Gabor means The hero of his people. And the hero of his people is the ruler of his people. He's sovereign. He's in control. Who rules the entire universe, not only for his glory, but also for the sake of his people. A world is in order, and it's behaving the way God wants it to behave because of the lordship and the kingship of this child. If anyone tells you as a believer, our world is out of control, that is a lie. It has been created by God and this king rules this world. Yes, there is wickedness in our world. Yes, there is unbelief in our world. Yes, there is darkness in our world because of sin. That's why we need to proclaim the word of God beyond Redeemer. That's why we want to take the gospel to the Muslims beyond our our fellowship and community here. Because our world is a place of darkness. But our world is under the, the might control of this child. Nehemiah understood that in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah number nine, chapter 9, 32. Where he said, Now therefore our Lord, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us. Now listen to this. Upon our kings, our uh, princes, princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the king of Assyria until this day. You see, you know, the people, they even couldn't get help from their kings, from their prophets, from their fathers, from their priests. Uh, Nehemiah said, our help comes only from you who are uh, great, who are mighty, who are an awesome God. From no one else. Only from this king, from this child who is the mighty God. It always strikes me. You know, Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ was uh, sleeping uh, uh, on the boat. And storm comes and his disciples were terrified. And they come to Jesus who was sleeping and they, uh, they woke him up. And, and they, they tell him, we are perishing. They were, they were trying to remind the creator, the God, the God-man, that there was a storm on the sea as if he didn't know. And Jesus wakes up and he steals the storm. And their response was, what the manner of man is this? You see, their response was not, what a manner of 
Savior is this? What a manner of God is this? It was what a manner of man. But man God, because from their childhood they were taught the only one who controls the nature and the universe is God himself. Any Jew child would know that. And they recognized Jesus. He is man, but we see God. He's in control. He's in control. I don't know what storm you are facing in your life this morning. You know it. But this child can steal it for you. If you only believe in him. A mighty God. And then comes everlasting Father. And if you are like me, you see the only time that I see the comfort and the peace and the encouragement of God is in this name. Everlasting Father. Now, Isaiah is not making a statement in relation to the Trinity. He's not saying the Son is uh, the Father. Yes, the Son is the Father. The Son is God. But he's not making this statement in relation to Trinity. Uh, he's making this statement in relation to the unique ministry and designation of the Messiah in relation to his people. He's telling you this child will... Uh, care for you the same way that the father cares for his children. From now onward, from now forever, he will take care of you as, uh, as a father to his children. Psalm 103, 13 and 14, as a father shows compassion, the psalmist said, to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. When the pastor doesn't understand your struggle, when the elders doesn't understand your struggle and pain, maybe because of their weakness, maybe because of their negligence, Maybe because you haven't told them everything about your problem. But this child will understand your pain. Like your father and your mother. And when they are not there for you, he will be there for you. Because he's eternal. Because he was dead, but he is alive. And think about his care for you. He was born in Bethlehem for you. He went to Calvary for you. He raised from the dead for you. He ascended to heaven for you. And now from heaven, he's interceding, interceding on your behalf. He's standing before the holy and perfect God on your behalf, calling your name as a child of God. He's coming back to take you home. That's it, his eternal care like a father for you. Eternal Father. You don't, need, you don't need to feel cold this morning. You don't, need, you don't need to feel desperate for anything in life. You have Jesus. You have Jesus, Prince of Peace. To restore peace in the world, he reigns in peace. Our Lord Jesus Christ didn't come to the world holding a sword to convert people to Christianity. He came to the world in peace. He came to the world to die on the cross for the sake of the sin of the people of God. Therefore, Paul says, since we have justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You are at peace with God today because you are in Christ Jesus. And you will hear more about this peace in the evening. So I will stop here. But let's consider the accomplishment of the child now. What's the, what's, what, what, what's the accomplishment of the child? We considered his identity. We considered his names. What about his accomplishments? Notice verse 1. But there will be no gloom 
for her who was in anguish in the former time he brought into contempt the land of uh, Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And then he goes and he says, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. What is he talking about? You go to Matthew chapter 4, and you see Jesus going to this very region. You see him going in Matthew chapter 4. You see Jesus going to Zebulun and Naphtali and to uh, the Galilee of the nations and call people to repentance and faith. Simeon, Simeon, when he held Jesus Christ, he said, looking up to heaven, he said, Lord, now take your servant in peace. Let me depart in peace. Because I have seen, now I have seen your light, the light for Gentiles, the light of salvation for Gentiles, and he was holding Jesus on his arms. And he said, I see now a light for your people. You see, his first accomplishment was illumination. His first accomplish, accomplishment was he delivered, he brought the knowledge of the true and the living God to his people. You know God today because of Christ. Christ made God known to you. He illuminated, he illuminated your mind and your heart to the knowledge of God. And his second accomplishment is in verse 3. And this is marvelous. And this is what people, most of our people in the world today doesn't see. For you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. And they are glad when they divide the spoil. What is this joy, my friends? The inclusion of the Gentiles into the covenant of God. And Isaiah is saying that should bring joy to the people of God, to you Gentiles. For you to see, you yourself as a Gentile, you have been reconciled with God by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been included in the kingdom of God. But also you, you see the inclusion of other Gentiles to, to the number of the elect, to the number of the kingdom of God. And Isaiah is saying, this should be the reason for your joy today. The question is, is it? Is, is, is the reason for our joy for this season, the inclusion of Gentiles in the kingdom of God, the salvation of sinners, is it? That's the question. Think about what the world offers to you. Not the increase of the kingdom of God, but God offers to you the increase of uh, the kingdom of God. Jeremiah in search 3.22, he said, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant. I will do this among you. Through this child, through Jesus Christ, isn't what we long and pray to see even here at Redeemer? The inclusion of Gentiles in our number. And then all of us together to rejoice, to, to sense, to have a sense and a feeling of this joy, what this joy means in the church of Jesus Christ and in the life of a Christian, for us to jump in joy by seeing sinners being saved and be rec being reconciled with God. That's not the joy that the world tries to bring to you today. Just to give you an example, think about this. It's a song. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. From now on, all your troubles will be out of sight. This is the joy that the world offers to you. 
to make your heart light. You can't do that. It's simple. And do you really want to have a little Christmas? A little? You know, this song was sung and composed in 1943, 74 years, and your trouble are still here. They're not gone. This is foolishness. This is what the world offers to you. But the good tidings that the angel gave to the shepherds and to all of us was, what I have for you is not little, it is great news. A Savior has been born for you to redeem you from the power of sin and to redeem others from the power of sin. And you will see that and you will rejoice. You will rejoice. Question to all of you this morning is this. Are you in awe of the child who is Jesus Christ, the King? Does the names of Jesus Christ, these names that we consider uh, today, do they mean what they mean here in your life? Do you have a wonderful counselor in your life? Do you have a mighty God in your life? Do you have an everlasting father for your life? Do you have a prince of peace in your life? That the names of Jesus Christ makes a difference in your life. Is the incarnation and what it delivered, salvation to all people, the center of your joy today and every day, not once in a year, my friends, every moment of your life, is that a reason for your joy? We are not about celebration. We are about eternal life. We are about Jesus. And I want to encourage all of you today to come to Jesus Christ, to come to this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father and Prince of Peace with a worshiping heart. Enjoy friendship, enjoy family, enjoy food, enjoy drink. That's not sinful. But if you don't, Christ make, if you don't make Christ an issue in this season, you are missing the point. He's an issue. Jesus Christ, the God-man, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we, we give thanks to you for the message of your word, for the illumination and enlightenment that you have given us through the Holy Spirit. Help us to apply all the things that we have heard this morning in our own life and our Christian walk. And make even uh, this local church and all our sister churches here in America to remember the incarnation, the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ, in a meaningful way, in a way that would bring glory uh, to you and to the adva advancement of your kingdom among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together and we we'll respond to the preaching of the